what is up? We are talking about fearing the unfamiliar. Most people are uncomfortable in new situations. They don't know exactly what to expect. So puts them at an ill at ease. Although there may be various gradients of fear involved, almost everyone has some degree of discomfort or fear in new situations. Adoptees, as well as other trauma victims, may have more fear than others in new situations. But even though this may be true, an honest evaluation of the situation needs to be made. This situation may be new, but it is it, it really something to fear. What might actually come up that can sorry question what might actually come up that can't be handled? It is very important to make sure that the fear of the unfamiliar situation doesn't become global. That is realistic and manageable. When dealing with the unfamiliar, it is important to take one thing at a time. What is actually going on here? And what can I do to solve it? It doesn't help to become the victim and say, I can't do this. It's too much for me. After all, adoptees, of all people, have had a great deal of practice in dealing with the unfamiliar. Therefore, all of you who are adoptees should be really good at dealing with anything new. Use what you have learned. Adapt where you have to. Be innovative where you can. And try not to make Sorry, try not to mistake instruction, suggestion, and constructive criticism as complete control over you or rejection of you. Adoptees have to be very aware of these differences because they may feel all the same. This is why some adoptees have difficulties in retaining jobs, especially as adolescents. An adolescent for adoptees may be prolonged, by the way. The ordinary things that everyone has to put up with such as getting to work on time and having a good attitude towards clients, customers, and fellow workers often seem to like often seem like control to adoptees and they quit in a huff or they get fired for not complying. Then they feel very self righteous and blaming the offending boss or supervisor. Well, he was a jerk anyway, kind of thing. Rarely do they question their own integrity. I wonder if I got fired because I came to work late every day and took a couple of days off without permission. Self-reflection is often absent in these situations. Remember what Siegel said about self-reflection when feelings are generated by implicit memories? These implicit rec recollections are not usually subject to a process of self-reflection as in, why am I doing this or feeling this way? Individuals may sense these experiences as just defining who they are. This is why adoptees so often feel personally rejected by ordinary circumstances, such as being fired for non-compliance. They believe, this is just the way I am. This belief increases their fear of interviewing for another job. There is that little knot of doubt about their own competency. It isn't competency that needs to be questioned, but compliance. My experience with adoptees is that they are very good workers, but they do have a problem with simple rules listed above. Therefore, they sabotage their positions at work by non-compliance rather than incompetency. This is a di direct result of their misunderstanding simple rules of conduct which everyone has to follow, and seeing those same rules as an attempt to control them personally. This is very destructive and totally unnecessary. It calls for a reality check and a vow to take responsibility for their own actions, as long as a person wants to grow and assume more power in their life. There is going to be fear. Unless a person wants to feel helpless all the time, they're going to have to push through the fear, and as Jeffers said, do it anyway. As she points out, pushing through fear is less frightening than living with the underlying fear that comes <coughs> from a feeling of helplessness. Feeling helplessness, feeling helpless means being the victim and feeling powerless. And how scary is that? All right. So, 
I don't know if I fully believe what Nancy Newton Verrier is saying there in the sense that um, the competency in the job, okay? Like, I, I didn't take a poll. Um, I'm going to talk about my observation from adoptees for a minute <clears throat> from, again, um, anecdotal experience as well as, you know, like I said, observation. No official poll. I've noticed that the majority of adoptees that I've encountered throughout my lifetime or throughout social media tend to be in nurturing careers, okay, and or creative. Now, I think everyone is very individualistic. You know, I've, I've talked a little bit about, you know, some famous adoptees, right? So think um, Steve Jobs, Simone Biles, Colin Kaepernick. I've mentioned them uh, a couple chapter or couple videos ago. <clears throat> they have a different discipline, right? Two are very highly skilled athletes, and one was a high tech person, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's not to say that they haven't spoken out on their adoption. Um, I know Colin Kaepernick does more so than I've ever heard Steve Jobs do or Simone Biles. And I think that's a very, again, personal thing. <clears throat> that being said, I do find that the majority of adoptees tend to, like I said, be in, um, nurturing, um positions so like social work a lot in social work doctors authors um teachers um nurses or the creative field right so author is kind of in that sense i think a lot of us um who are authors tend to focus on the adoptee experience and not so much as like using it as a creative field. I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, think like, think, uh, like Broadway, right? A lot are actors, um, or graphic designers, you know, maybe they have podcasts, um, content creators, and I, I think it just is very dependent on the individual, um, and not so much like a putting us in a box, if that makes sense. Now, if you're going to put us in a box, I would say maybe look at if there's underlying things right? And I say underlying as in, I think there is a correlation. I, I need to do more research when it comes to like being diagnosed with autism, AD, ADHD, anxiety, and all that. And sometimes having specific scheduling, right? So like nine to five jobs, cubicles don't always work. Um, that was just honestly a big thing for me where I knew that my both, well, okay. <laughs> my, my adoptive dad, um, worked in law, right? So he had his office and like, yes, he has, well, I wouldn't call it a cubicle. He has his office or he had his office at the time. I'm like, yeah, he had pictures up, but it wasn't like creative in the sense that like you can get away with things. Right. Whereas my mom, who worked in social work, um, was a little bit more creative. Right. She could. Oh, excuse me. Pardon me. She, you know, like she brought in games and she, you know, you can like be creative with like music or art or, you know, questioning. Um, but they still had a fairly like typical schedule. Right? So, like, 8 to 6, 7 to f 
four, whatever it was. Um, and, and like, don't get me wrong, I've worked in positions that are like that. I did teach preschool. Um, and, and I would say with teaching, it, it gave me, it gave me a little bit of a balance because I got to be creative at the same time as like having a little bit more of a structure than being a content creator and, and all this. Um, and I think it's just very individualistic, right? Um, now I also worked in the food industry, right? Where it was kind of the same thing where I could be creative in a sense, you know, working, I'm, I worked under a very famous chocolatier. So, you know, working, getting to do those creative things, getting to bake and, and work with chocolate and, and all this stuff and, and, you know, food blogging and all this stuff. And I've been, I've been like all over the place, but having like that creativity as part of my job definitely helped me be more balanced, right? Whereas now with the content creating, I get to create my own schedule, which sometimes inhibits me, especially when like you've been sick and like you're catching up and you're scheduling. But at the same time, I can do what I want, but it, it's, you, you got to treat it like a business, you know? So I don't know where I was going with this. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily self-sabotaging. I feel like maybe it's not fulfilling. And, and maybe that's why the individual, and I feel like Nancy's trying to say, like, all adoptees are putting themselves into, like, this box of, like, non-compliance, right? That's not necessarily true. Um, I think it's just, it's very dependent on the person, right? But yeah, of course, like, we fear, we fear the unfamiliar, right? So, like, and that's just more of a generalist sta statement um, than adoptee specific. So I, I honestly would just take this little piece with a grain of salt. That's where I was going. I apologize. I just went on a rant for no reason. Um, I will see you guys next time for what having power is and isn't.